What's happening? Boys and girls of all ages, this is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Often imitated, never duplicated. What's going on? Yeah, it's been a week. It's been a week. You know, I kind of like doing shows like once a week. It's, I have a chance to sort of breathe and get real focused on the next one. Listen, I'll do motherfucking show every day. I don't give a fuck, but doing one, doing, doing one a week is leaves, leaves a lot of good time for preparation and stuff. What's up, Daniel? What's happening in, in, in L.A., brother? You know, yes, it's a matinee. This is a Sunday matinee. It is Sunday shout-out day. Let's get some shout-outs going. What's up, Gary? Nice to see you, bro. Sid the Kid, fuck Spectrum Cable. Next, Yeah, Sid's not coming on today. He's got problems with Spectrum Cable. You know, what's his name from um, Star Trek? What's his name? Picard? Uh, what's Picard's name? Um, he, he wrote an article. He called Spectrum Cable terrorists. It was, it was in the newspaper. <laughs> I have Spectrum Cable also. And yeah, they are terrorists, basically. You know, greetings from Brazil. Come on now. Hope you, yo, Thomas, hope you, keep him, hope you keep him Brazil in check. Yo, Ray Hogan, what's up? Is that it? You're wearing the white aggro shirt? I'm wearing the black one today. Shout, yo, shout out to Paris Mayhew, my old partner in the music vid- videos. You know, we did all the biohazard and typo negative and got some gold records together. Patrick Stewart. Can't be mad at Patrick Stewart if you saw a green room, man. That was great. Patrick Stewart's great. You can't be mad at, at Professor X, bro. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? What else? Hey, Fred, what's up? Come on now, Silence Equals Death, New Jersey represent. Shout out to me. Shout out to Silence Equals Death, who's probably at the peak of their game right now. Gotta say, you guys don't totally suck right now. Um, there you go. What else? Here you go, Paulie. What's up? Drew and crew checking in from Long Island via Florida. Shout out to James Drescher and Murphy's Law. Any particular reason? You know, shout out from Vegas. Jeff Bronk. How hot is it in Vegas? So, you know, someone said, show me something from in Arizona. It's like 120 degrees, you know? Crazy. Hey, he's back. I'm back. Andrew from TO, a.k.a. Toronto. All right, what's up, Andrew? 109. Fuck, fuck that. Right? Yep. Speaking of which, let's bring on the hardcore shutterbug. What's the drama, bro? What's up from Long Island? <laughs> by, by way of Long Island. What's up from the man cave? <laughs> that's it. That's it. It's See, not I just like the man. I got, I got, I got the, I got Daryl over here licking himself at the same time. So. I wish I could lick myself. <laughs> then you wouldn't have to do a show. Thank God I have a girlfriend to lick me. <laughs> Thank God it hasn't come to that where I don't have to lick myself. God, I have people lick me. <laughs> That's when you know you're important. God damn. I got, you know, anybody out there want to lick me? <laughs> Actually, you know, let me take that back. I don't want anybody to lick me. I don't want anyone near me anymore. Yo, we rode the train last night, me, me, and, me and, you know, Miss Excitement, and holy shit, <laughs> the fucking subway in New York City, you, it's like the Warriors, bro. Yep. Well, it's a rolling mental hospital. And men, uh, ro- no, it's, no, that's my line, bro. It's a rolling mental institution, um, homeless, shel- homeless, ho- homeless, homeless shelter. I'm not crazy. And All right, here we go, photo of the day. Yeah, this let's good. do it. This is good. And you know what? I'm going to say this. This is good. Well, let's just get to it. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, wrong answers only, please. This is photo of the day. Boom. Photo of the day. What do we got? Let's let's see. Let's see who uh, who knows who knows this one. Looking I didn't for, know this one. You knew for, this one. Yeah, because I know this guy. Yeah, this was uh, this was I, kind of an interesting moment. Yeah, I know this guy, bro. Forever, forever already. Um, looking for professional liquors. <laughs> you need a liquor license. I need a liquor license. Do you have a liquor license? <laughs> is it Morgan Freeman? Good one. Is it, is it Randy Rhodes? Did Randy Rhodes play, have the, the target guitar or was that Zach Wilde? 
Is that Zach Wilde has the, the target guitar? Yeah. Right. Is Randy it Dr. The poke, the polka is it Dr. No? Is it J Jimi Hendrix with a Y? Is it Laser Lloyd? Good one, bro. Ah. Good one. Is it Zach? Is it Message from Another World? Is it Drew Stone's 40 Licks Tour? <laughs> is it Living Brain's Color? Is it Eddie Van Halen? Is it Gay Gay French? You know, you know, I almost, you know, we almost had JJ French on the show. Yeah. I, I, mean, I like did, JJ French. He was great. You did the thing at Generation with him. And yeah, I, I moderated his book event. He's great. He's a smart guy. He lives in my was, neighborhood. That was, a, that was a fun. That was a fun day too. He lives three blocks from me here. That guy's seen. Not some to talk shit. about where. Not to talk about where people live. You know. Right. Right. Is it Vernon Reed? Is it Pete Townsend? You know what? I'm going to. Let me post up another one here, and you. Okay. You, and, and you can. Uh, you could tell us, just tell us, because you called, you you sent me a message that day. You were like, "Yo, yeah." Tell us, tell us about what's going on here. Well, I was I I work right next door to City Field at the railroad, and I was walking around on my lunch break, and I had to call you because I knew that the Dead and Company was at City Field that night, and you can't even see from this angle, but one of the other shots there had to be like tents going all the way back. And I know that you are, you are uh, a big dead fan. And uh, look at this. There, there, there it is. There it is. It, so, it looks like district nine. It looks like, you know, a, like a tent city of, and I said, you got to see this. And you knew obviously about it. And, and I walked down there and it was actually really cool I'm, I mean, I like the dead, but I don't love them like you do. But the, you know, the fact that it was like this craft fair of shirts and food and, you know, and drink and all sorts of shenanigans. So, so, what this, what, so what this is, is what they do now at this point, at this stage of the game, and is that they, they contain it in one parking lot. And, and, and people pay for like a vending. It's a, they, they have to pay the, if they want to vend, then they end up in this parking lot. And it's basically like a friggin' it, it's, it's like a flea market. It's a flea market. You know, like a street fair, you know? Yeah. It, it, now, it's an, what, in it's the old a, days, it didn't used to be this way. Like it's an open. Listen, we're going to get into this for a second here. And this ties in with the Pantera thing, honestly, that's going on. It's like, this Pantera thing's happening right now, and people are like, half the people are freaking out, and half the people, you know, are, you know, you know, you know, think it's think it's really great, you know? But like this 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 dead and company thing is very similar. You know, Jerry Garcia is dead. And you know Pink Pen is dead and well, Pink uh, Pen's long dead. But right. this this is basically John Mayer is like in the role of Jerry Garcia now, and they do all Grateful Dead songs. And um, I happened, um, uh, but just just to touch on it, um, it's interesting because let me just say that like my my take on it really is it, with the Pantera thing or whatever it, it, with the Dead thing. It's a celebration of the music, you know. And it's just like this is the world we live in now. It's like. And, and any like people go, oh, you know, that, you know, that's bullshit or this and that. Listen, this is a picture I went to. I went to the dead show last night. It's a picture that I took, you know. Nice. So that. there's a lot of people that don't think it's bullshit. A lot of people yeah. just enjoy, enjoy the music. And a lot of people are going to go to to the um, enjoy the Pantera thing. I look at it as it's a celebration of the music. I don't really get hung up on the shit. You know, and that was two I, nights, right? That was two nights at City Field. Listen, the moral of the story is here. The moral of the story he, here is basically, and you could see from the look in her face. <laughs> don't bring, is. don't bring your goth girlfriend to the to the, to the dead flea market, or you <laughs> get a look, or you get a look like this. You get you get daggers there. 
So we went last night. She's never been. I brought her. You know, she lasted like an hour or two before, you know. So that's only like two songs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> but yeah. But uh, but yeah, we, we but this was a cool thing to do. We wandered around, we wandered around in there. Well, I and, thought that was great. I thought that was like really fun. That just the vibe was super fun. Uh, the you know the ironic thing is, I was working and I I was not pre expecting to go to the Dead and Company flea market, and I was wearing a John Wick shirt that said "Hate Humans" in big letters. Right. And uh, well, yeah, getting back to this gentleman who I just took his picture because he was talking to me. And I thought he yeah, that's had a, that's, a cool that's, look. That's that's Harry. Um, uh, he was a, uh, a, a a staple, a staple on the Venice on the Venice Beach Strand for many 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 years. Uh, you know, and he he I, I guess he travels around because like this traveling friggin' vending circus follows you know the dead around, and and so I guess he's part of that. I, I you know. I talked to him a little bit, you know, he's, he's a bit out there, but he was a Venice beach staple for many years. He just like wails away on guitar. Usually he's on roller skates, you know? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, um, it's funny because a number of people recognized him, you know, when I posted some photos and, and I didn't, I didn't realize, you know, like I, I don't know the dead like you do. So I just found him interesting when I took his photo yeah. and that was kind I'm of I'm cool. sure, I'm sure as soon as you took that photo, he started trying to sell you something, right? Oh, the shirt on his shoulder. You see yeah. the shirt? Yeah. He took that shirt over and it was a painting yeah. of him on the shirt. Yeah, yeah. No, he's he's he he's he hustles, man. But, yeah, he's like you know, a, the Venice Beach rat bones. Listen, you know the dead thing, bro. It, it's 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 sort of odd for me, uh, which which I'm sure people could say that about a lot of bands. You know, I as a very young teenager, I saw the Grateful Dead many times and traveled across the country. I don't want to get into what was going on there. I was in, right. I was in, I was in with a crew and we were traveling the country and we were hustling and uh, going from show to show. This is when I was very young, and this is before hardcore even came into my life. You know, wow. um, it was sort of like riding the rails. You know, and I traveled the country as a young teenager. You know, let's be frank: selling LSD and hustling. <laughs> and and uh, going from show to show and, and and really living it up, and I saw many shows, many Grateful Dead shows. Do, do you when remember was, your your first one? Like when, when was yes, your first Dead show? Nineteen seventy eight Giant Stadium. Wow. A uh, Grateful Dead, Willie Nelson, New Riders of the Purple Sage. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty cool. Actually. Yeah, I was young, bro. I was like thirteen at the time, or fourteen. But anyway, so to see what's going on now it's like a faint echo of the past kind of, you know what I mean? But I understand it's a celebration of the music and yeah. if people want to celebrate the music and dance and have fun, good for them. The fuck do I care? You know, I enjoy you know it. I enjoy it. I I'll go enjoy Pantera. You know what? My, my take on Pantera you know is what? I'll fucking enjoy Molly Hatchet, which has no <laughs> original members in it. I don't give a fuck. It's a celebration of the music. I'm a music lover. I'm not like hung up on all these, oh, there's only one guy farted on the third record. Like, I don't give a fuck, bro. Well, you know what? With, with Pantera, you have obviously, you know, Dime, you have you have Rex and Phil. But the cool thing about Zach and Charlie is that I personally think they're the perfect choices to do it. Oh, yeah. But they were they also played. very close with yeah. the brothers. Like, these are the guys that the brothers were like, buddies with and like yeah. charlie benante who is absolutely one of the best drummers in heavy music yeah. Yeah, yeah. and zach who is not the same as dime but he has a similar vibe you know i think it's a perfect lineup and i'm looking forward to it myself yeah. you know i don't care what a what a lot of people you know what shit, I, I i knew it was coming down the pipe for a while yeah yeah it's I, been, I, I mean I it's knew. been a long time but but i but i knew who was involved it was just you know, wasn't well. Charlie me that, was the last one. I I didn't hear about Charlie till they announced it. I heard about it a while ago, but and I'm I'm thrilled because I think he's I think he's a fantastic choice. RS seventy says never say anything bad about Billy Joel again. <laughs> I know I like lost all credibility talking about the Grateful Dead. <laughs> it's like, what do I know, bro? You know what do I know? I, you know. RS70, right. I'm thinking of RS70 because we had some graffiti this week on the trains. I should have taken a picture for him. 
You got it, man. So, yeah. But uh, yeah, Robert Hogg says Napalm Death, no original members, and still killing it today. Yes, just celebrate the music. Yeah, whatever. So well, think think about bands that go through stages like Deep Purple did, Mach One, Mach Two, Mach Three. Yo, before you before know. we say about, you know, I gotta say this, being that I'm somewhat friends with some people in the Deep Purple camp. I mean, we had Deep Deep Purple keyboard player, um, yeah. you know, uh, on the show, and um, and his son uh, Mike um mike airy yo their new deep purple release is all cover songs and i've listened to it a bunch of times i enjoy it god ian gillen still has the voice man he really does well, but to hear not, listen he's not the voice hear, of 1970 listen, but he's no david coverdale who's friggin shot <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right hey let me let me get going here i'll see you i'll talk all to right you in a bit. i'll see everybody right. in a bit all right well there you go this is the New York Hardcore Chronicles live, and we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Generation Records, 126 Hardcore Clothing, and Grunge and Grime Soap Company. They're a handmade soap and skincare company with a rock and roll spirit. Based in Nashville, Tennessee, they combine their love for rock music and their love for creating products that are good for your skin and good for your soul. Since 2019, they've been creating high-quality, handmade natural soaps and skincare products with eth ethically sourced and sustainable ingredients. They give 10% of their net proceeds to the local and community outreach programs. Visit the website at www.grungeandgrimesoapcompany.com and enter the code DREW, as in D-R-E-W, to get 20% off your first order. Come on now, the Texas Silver Rush. It's a jewelry design firm and boutique store located in the birthplace of the Texas country music scene in Fredericksburg, Texas. They specialize in working with all musicians in all music genres to design and create unique one-off pieces, well styled them for stage, album covers, promo photos, and social media exposure. The client list includes Rock Roll Hall of Famous, Greg Rollet, Ring of Star, and of course, Agnostic Front. Information and online sales are being taken at their Facebook and Instagram pages, and of course, www.thetexassilverrush.com. Last but not least, Come on now, it is 126 Hardcore Clothing. They're a streetwear brand for restless individuals who don't compromise, like you. They are about being positive, spontaneous, and true to yourself. For years, for years, they experimented with several printing methods and materials and collaborated with a large number of designers and illustrators, always giving room for fresh perspectives while retaining the hardcore attitude. Get in touch with them. Ramp up your game at www.126clothing.com. Hey, let's bring our guest on. Let's clear the deck. What the heck? Hey, Marla, how you doing? Portland represent. There you go. Um, here we go. Let's get it on. All right. Let me clear the deck. Let's talk some music. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know. I don't know what you're doing today on this Sunday. But I think we're going to talk some music, so don't get spooked. Today's guest is an American bassist, guitarist, vocalist, and avid skateboarder, hailing from the old Dominion state of Virginia. In his incredibly proficient career, he is known for his work with the bands Jesuit, Doom Riders, Cavalera Conspiracy, Old Man Gloom, Cave In, and of course, Converge. Please welcome... Coming at us from Ipswich, Mass., Mr. Nate Newton. Brother! What's up? How's it going? How are you, buddy? It's good. I'm great. Happy to be here, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm hanging in my barn. Coming on. Yeah, it's beautiful. I appreciate you having me, man. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I, look, I, looked, I looked on the map. Ipswich, Massachusetts is like a really a beautiful place, man. It is. I love it here, man. We kind of just ended up here randomly. Um, my wife and I lived in Salem, Mass. for a long time. And, uh, right. you know, it, it was just like condominium apartment living. And we were like, I want a house with a, you know, with a yard. And we were just driving around and we drove past this house that was for sale. And we were, it, we we're like, this place is cool. Let's check it out. And uh, that's awesome. how we live here. That's so, right. Yeah. That's like your that's like your home base. Oh yeah, one hundred percent, man. It's it's, it's nice. It's nice. Uh, I mean, I, I lived 
I lived in Vermont for a couple of years when I was doing a lot of filming and traveling the world, doing all the street bike films. And sort of my attitude back then with it was, it doesn't matter really where I live. Um, I'm traveling the world. I just want a nice, beautiful place to come home to. Now, I mean, I mean, uh, not not to not to, but but it turned out, you know, Vermont's beautiful. You know, it was, it was great. It's it's different than New York, that's for sure, or L.A. Yeah. You know, there you um, go. I mean, it's great here because we've got the beach just a couple miles away, and it's it, it's gorgeous. So it's like every summer, people are like, "What are you guys doing for vacation?" We're like, "We live here. <laughs> like we're just yeah. hanging out. It's yeah. great. We're going you're, to the beach. Yeah, you're, you're, you're looking at it. <laughs> yeah." Yeah. We're lazy, man. <laughs> well, listen, you can you can be lazy, man. You you are an incredibly hardworking career career musician. Uh, what's the latest? Uh, what's been going on? Fill us, you know, bring us up uh, to speed. What's the latest? The latest is um, I like just earlier this week. I just got back from Europe. Um, we did the Converge Blood Moon tour over there, and then that ended, and we did an Old Man Gloom tour. Um, you know, over the pandemic, we released the Converge Blood Moon album. We released two Old Man Gloom albums. The new Cave In album came out um, just, a, I guess, about a month ago, something like that. Mm -hmm. And hey, there you go. Yeah, that's us. I did that. Yeah. And, um, and then in like four days, we leave for a Cave In US tour. So it never ends. We just keep rolling. Yeah, and and we'll 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 make we'll we will make our way to this Converge Blood Moon uh, project. But wow, that, that really that really threw me for a pleasant loop when I was doing my homework and and I came across it. Really, a commendable project, man. Real, really, uh, pretty great, you know. Thank you. I'm uh, I'm glad. It's uh, that's kind of what we were going for, I guess. I mean, we just wanted to do something different that we hadn't done in the past and you know what you know what let's 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 jump into this a little bit here sure um you know uh, tell us a little bit like you know how this how this uh project came about and, and how uh the collaboration uh came about well we had kind of been mutually fans of each other's music for quite some time right. and then steve brodsky uh who also played on the record he was actually in converge before i was is that is that, uh, he, I, is that Steve I took his Brodsky? place is that Steve um, Brodsky? on bass is that, because is that Steve Brodsky that's in that's Quicksand him now? Yep. Yeah. Same same Steve Brodsky. He's also in Caven with me and Old Man Gloom. Got it. So uh, yeah. So you know we all just wanted to make some noise together, but really it all started because um, Roadburn Festival asked us. Oh gosh, twenty. 15 2016 something like that they reached out to us and said hey we want to do we want to have converge play but you only play your slow more ambient material right and so we and we'd been wanting to do that forever so we were like yeah, hell yeah. yeah but then as we started trying to figure out how to do it we realized you know we can't pull this off with just the four of us you know we right. need we need to get more people involved and we were fans of of Chelsea and Ben Chisholm and had been, you know, had become friends with them. Um, we reached out to Ben about doing all of like the programming and keys stuff. And as he started working on it, um, Chelsea was just like, do you think they'd want me to do it too? And we were like, fuck yes. <laughs> so uh, now, now for those that may not know, Chelsea's the gal that does the vocals and yes. she plays guitar. She does play guitar. Yeah. 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 Um, and I mean, she's just an incredibly gifted singer and songwriter. Um, so we went about that just getting together and figuring out new versions of, of a lot of Converge songs to play at the festival uh, with Chelsea on vocals. And actually, Steve Von Till joined in for a song as well. And um, we played the shows and just had a blast and all of us were like this works we should yeah we great. should try to write some music together and that was kind of the start of it we you know we were all just coming up with ideas here and there and then the pandemic hit and 
we all just we had a shared Dropbox and we all just kept putting ideas in it. And then from there, it just turned into no one having anything to do. So we just started adding to the songs. And uh, next thing you know, we had an had an album. And here we are. Here's you, you know, this this is this is worth touching on. Uh, RS70 asks, uh, you know, does he do the cover art? And I think, and I, I know we're, we're, we're sort of, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but one thing that, you know, Converge and, 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 and is known for is, is really is a lot of the artwork and stuff. Who does the, who does the cover art? Um, that is almost exclusively, or well, all of the artwork almost exclusively is, uh, Jake Bannon, who sings for who Converge. Sings, yeah. And, and um, he's he's a very talented artist. He does a yes, lot of great stuff. Yeah. He is. He's he's got a vision and he understands how to sort of implement it in a way that uh really fits with the music. Um yeah. and, and that was something that I think if you wanna deep dive, like yeah, yeah. I remember having I re I remember having conversations with him like back even before I joined the band with how, you know, in the nineties, it seemed like hardcore and punk had sort of gotten away from that marriage between visual art and, sure. and the music that really existed in the eighties. And that was what we were really influenced by. And that needs to come back. You know, it's like, where's, where's the misfit skull? Yeah. of our generation where are the black flag bars where you know like yeah yeah you see like uh the is it the jeff gaither artwork from the accused albums like you see that stuff and you know what it is and that that know, icon that that iconography is so yeah. identi is so identifiable with bands the, the bars the misfit stuff the yeah the the, 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 new york, the, raymond, the, new york, the new york hardcore symbol yeah the the raymond pettibone artwork with black right. flag like all of that That's stuff right. was very much you know, a huge influence on our vision for all of our bands, really. But Jake, I feel like implemented it far better than than I had, you yeah. know, because I'm not an artist. But sure. once uh, once I joined Converge, um, you know, we had we had multiple conversations about that, and he really took it to a new level. So, did you did you grow up in a musical household? Uh, how did music come into your life, and who were your early influences? Um, I don't know if it was necessarily a musical household. Um, my grandfather who passed away when I was really, really young, like, you know, one, two years old, something like that. Um, he was a country Western musician and, you know, I, I didn't know him that way. certainly not as a musician in any way that he could have influenced me, but the, you know, he left a, a quite a, quite a shadow. And um, so there was always an appreciation for music in uh, in my house. And my parents were super cool and super into good music. You know, like mm -hmm. I remember being five years old and I can't believe they let me. Well, maybe they didn't let me. Maybe I just <laughs> did it. But like they let me go through the records and put stuff on the record player. And, you know, I, I'd be digging through my parents' records and like pulling out David Bowie, Diamond dogs and like what is this record cover i need to know what this is all about and, or like now, Lou now, Reed, as, rock as and a, roll as animal a child or... as a child you grew up in virginia beach yes yeah so uh there was like the the big things in in our house <laughs> were you know like all these all these cool records and my dad is a surfer and so we were at the beach all the time and that was kind of just that was life and it was cool a, a, a great a great environment uh for for a young person uh, uh, and uh that was uh really uh enabled you to to uh seek a life in the arts so so to speak and, and yeah and I, I can and i can relate i grew up in a similar household yeah i mean i don't know if that was necessarily uh what they expected but yeah. you know I, I guess when you're five years old listening to Lou Reed, you're you're gonna seek out weird stuff for the rest of your life. <laughs> hey, by the way, Magnus says old man gloom crushed in Manchester last week. <laughs> Thank you, Magnus. It was good to meet you, man. 
Oh, you you know Magnus. You met Magnus. I do. Yeah, okay. yeah. We we had a had a nice conversation at the show. Hobo Cakes asks, "Do you surf?" I would not call myself a surfer. I can <laughs> surf. I have been known to go surfing. I kind of have to be coaxed into going surfing by my friends who actually are real surfers. Um, it's it's more work than skateboarding. Skateboarding, I can just step outside and I'm I'm there. You know, surfing is like, oh, you have to get up and know when the waves are breaking and where and drive there and the water's cold and oh yeah there's me at kona skate park in 1988 87 88 something like that so so skateboarding was big in your world as a young person yeah i mean if 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 you know virginia beach at all it's, it's a massive part of the culture there um you know i grew up just a few minutes away from mount trashmore which was like one of the big public skate parks with a big vert ramp. And so, you know, every year there were pro contests there and, wow. you know, it was, it was just kind of part of the culture. Every kid I knew had a skateboard, you know, it's just what you did. Like I never played soccer or baseball or anything like that. It was, wow, that's a cool, this, is, this is a pretty cool pool. Yeah, that thing was gnarly. It was before they yeah, that thing it. Looked, that thing looks pretty badass. Yeah, like if if you if you Google the pool? I can't tell is it a pool or is it a skate park? That's Kona Skate Park. So if you uh, Google okay. that now, they've like totally redone it and fixed the transitions right. and everything. Right. When I went my so this was on a trip that my my family went on to Disney World and I was, you know, I was a 13-year-old shit. So I was just like, <laughs> I don't I don't want to do this. I only right. want to skate. And I was like, I'll only go if you <laughs> take me to Kona Skate Park. Like, like I had a choice. They were going to make me. I'm going to Disney World, dude. Like, whatever. So, like, yeah. um, but my parents were very cool about it. And they took my brother and, and myself to Kona Skate Park. And, uh, you know, it was amazing. It was legendary. So I was really, really psyched about that. How about these two gems here? So that... That's the front and back, same board. That's my very first skateboard right there that my Uncle Sean gave me when I was five years old. It was his board, his uh, GNS uh, Stacy Peralta Warp Tail, which when I was in like sixth grade, I was dumb and I took the tr trucks and wheels off of it and put them on something else and I don't, they're gone. Lost a ton. Were the wheels like Sims uh, Pure Juice or whatever? Pure Juice. <laughs> That's yeah. exactly what they were, and with yeah, Bennett yeah, trucks. Yeah. Oh, I can't believe now. I lost them. Yeah, I, you know, I remember. It. I had. I remember the Road Rider, the Road Rider trucks. Mm -hmm. the, 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 with, yeah, those. Are, that's that's what we had here in the city. A city, a city, a city. Kids had the the road the the, the Road Rider trucks and, and the Sims, the Pure Juice wheels, man. Oh, you they know? they were the classics. You were ripping it though, man. I, I've seen Death Ball to downtown. I know what's going on. <laughs> You know, you know what's, you know, while we're, well, one last, one last shot of you kind of tearing, tearing it up. And as a youngster, right? Yeah. Um, that's, that's the snake run at Kona right there. And, and the, and the park is still there. Yeah. Park's still going. I think it's the longest running private skate park in, in the United States, maybe in the world. I live I live in the uh, Upper West Side of Manhattan, and I am right near the Andy Kessler Skate Park. And of course, Andy Kessler is a kid that grew up in this neighborhood. Uh, you know, we're the same age, and uh, you know, I grew up as a, a teenager in Manhattan. You know, basically doing everything we could to avoid Andy Kessler. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I met Andy much later in his life. Yeah. I've heard lots of stories about him when he was younger and it sounds like I probably would not have gotten along with him back then, but you know when I when I met him he was just a gracious, wonderful human being. And you know it's really interesting and it's, it's very sad uh, you know I ended up being friends with Andy and uh he he just really turned his life around and was just a really kind and gracious individual very different than the young teenager who terrorized uh, a lot of a lot of us uh, in 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 Manhattan uh, when we were growing up you know
I mean, yeah, that, that sounds right. I think that's uh that's a story that's true for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But I, um, I only have really positive memories of Andy. Yeah, absolutely. A- absolutely. It, it, you know, uh, and his, his, Andy Kessler skate park is, is walking distance from where I live. You know, that's a fun one, man. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about the music thing and give us some perspective on this shot right here. <laughs> All right. So, uh, this is myself, my friend, Brian and my friend, Eric, uh, when we were, we were in high school, I, I was maybe, I don't know, 10th or probably 11th grade. And, um, Murphy's Law was coming through, and yeah, played, and, and look at uh, and look at that Murphy's Law lineup. It's Jimmy. There's Chuck, uh, Todd Youth next to him. Uh, I think yep. that's Ra- Raven. It was Raven playing sax. Yep, that's Raven. And I yep. wonder who's playing drums. I can't tell who's playing drums there. I don't remember his. Yeah, name. it's not Go. Um, yeah, no, but um, yeah, that was. People are freaking on this picture. This is a I can't great even shot. remember what can't even remember what year that was. But and, um, and, and, and what and you are where are you in this picture? On the- so that that was at a record store in Virginia uh-huh. Beach called um, Electric Smiles Records, and they had a, like an in-store autograph signing the day of their show, and I couldn't go to the show that night because it was twenty-one right. and over. And so me and my friend Brian there in the naked ray gun shirt, and Eric down at the bottom there, we. That's cool. I think I think my dad's watching this. So dad, I'm sorry, but we skipped <laughs> to to meet Murphy's Law. Mm-hmm. And we were the only people that showed up and they were really kind and really cool and we uh we just um did some record shopping and talked and like I was what you can't see him but I was wearing these bright red Doc Martens uh <laughs> eight eyes that, that i you know i got them for my birthday i was so stoked and, is that a dog uh, is that a dog town shirt you're wearing no that's a gorilla biscuit shirt ah and um so i'm wearing these docks and uh jimmy he probably i mean of course he doesn't remember this i'm sure but uh he was like those are cool you should antique those and i was like what does that mean and then he sat there and <laughs> taught me how to antique my docks and uh we talked about music and he was picking records and like all those guys they were like you need this record check this record out none of them were punk or hardcore records it was like reggae records and jazz records and, yeah, and yeah. cool old rock records and i uh i spent all my allowance on, on uh records that those guys recommended and uh, i'm thankful for that i want it's a it's a great memory yeah stuff like that and and it must have been exciting when when sort of uh you know when uh how do you say it like interlopers infiltrated the outlying area and like yeah. from places like new york and 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 you know and, and i can relate as a kid you know growing up when black flag would come to town or the misfits or or whatever it was you know it it, it was it was certainly uh, all hands on deck you know oh yeah i mean it it was it it was just super cool to meet those guys you know like to me they were larger than life and like even though we had a really cool scene down there and bands would come through all the time it all just seemed unattainable to me at the time you know yeah and uh and- it's funny funny little story about this about that exact mm-hmm. photo is uh so years later like decades later um i'm on tour with doom riders and we're out opening up for danzig and Todd mm. Youth was playing guitar. And I brought yeah. that photograph with me to show it to him. I was like, look, this is you and me 20 years ago or whatever, you know, and and he he was my his mind was blown. Like he was like, What the fuck? It yeah. was super cool. You you you're 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 prompting me to you're prompting me right now to to dig in into the file here. Go uh, for it. And uh because I was close with Todd and uh Here's a shot of me and Todd on stage. Here's two shots of me and Todd on stage. Uh, when they play, once when Fireburn played Tompkins Square Park, you know, uh, it was a talented guy, man. Oh, you know, awesome. You know, he, that's, man, uh, he was just such a great guitarist. Yeah, he was a very talented guy, man. He he, he always was. He, he was very talented. Here's one that I really like. 
know, he used to do, they used to do these things at the Bowery Electric. This is, this is me and him. I think, you know, he would do like, they would do like a black flag thing where, where it had a backing band and it was all yes. black flag song. Yeah. And I think this is, this, I did a black flag one. I did a motorhead one and a bab Rains one. This could be like, you know, and Mike Mackey was playing drums and like, you know, Melvin Gibbs was playing bass. It was like oh, that, great. That's awesome, man. Yeah. That's, really, that's so much fun. Really great. Yeah, stuff, You know, man. Todd was like, there, there were a lot of great guitar players in hardcore, but mm -hmm. not many of them are able to go outside of hardcore and play right. with people that don't come from that world. And he could just do it. Like he was incredible, man. I remember every night on those Danzig dates, just watching him like, fuck, he's good. <laughs> I remember, I remember, you know, he played, he played with Glenn Campbell, you know, he, he, mm -hmm. he really, he, he really got out there. He played with Ace Freely, right? He played with Ace a little bit, you know, and he yeah. told me a great, he told me the great story about when he played with Motorhead. He, uh, he, I guess, um, Motorhead's guitar player, um, Phil was, was yeah. when, I think his mother, his mother was sick or something, so he couldn't play. So they flew Todd in Todd, Todd listened, you know, like was practicing on the plane and everything. Wow. He went to do, he went to do a sound check and they did one song and Lemmy said, okay, that's, that's good. And Todd said, well, wait a second. Don't, don't you want to, don't you want to run? And Lemmy said, if you don't know the shit by now, it don't, you, you never get, you know, you never get, and, 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 and walked off the sound check and Todd was like, oh, that is terrifying, dude. Yeah. And, 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 and Todd said, and Todd said, it, it was just great. Here's, here's a cherished photo of mine that I use a lot. This was during the making of the New York Hardcore Chronicles film. That's Todd, me, Roger from Agnostic Front and Vinny Stigma on, on Avenue uh, A and 7th that's Street. That's a great and, photo. Yeah, it's great, man. So. Todd Youth, uh, God rest your soul, man. We, we, we miss you. Let, let's talk a little bit about, you know, how, how music sort of got going for you. And I believe this is one of your first bands, one of your first shows. Yeah, that's my second band. That's Channel. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I, probably not one of our first shows, but relatively early-ish in my career. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hate calling yeah. it that. Um. I actually, I think I sent you the flyer for this show too. This was a veil into another and channel mm -hmm. at the insect club in uh, Hampton, Virginia. Um, Let me see. I have it. Let me dig it up. Dig it up. But a veil, uh, yeah. into, a veil into an, here it is. I got it. Um, Yale, those guys. There you go. There you go. That's the one. Yeah, but uh, I, I, yeah. and of course, of course, me being a, a a a fan and of you know, and I put the I put a book out and working on another one. Big fan of flyer art, and and like you talked about, is how you know uh, this 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 sort of flyer artwork and stuff uh, was so important to that era. Yeah, you know, it, like hand drawn flyers. It, yeah, I'm man. glad to see that making a comeback. You know, it, it is. Was, it is like in the in the late nineties and early two thousands, like yeah, every, everybody had a computer and we're just using all the same boring fonts to make their flyers and stuff. And I was like, this does not make me want to go to a show, but I yeah. look at that flyer and I'm like, I don't yeah. know what that is, but I want to go to that. It, it looks demented. I want to go. Yeah. Hey, Hobo, Hobo Cakes asks, how old were you when you started playing music? Did you start on guitar? I started on guitar. Um, I must have been 12, 13, something like that. Um, my uh, my family, we moved to Georgia for a year, like kind of near Atlanta. And Where's that, um, Macon? Uh, uh, Gwinnett. Gwinnett. I'm Gw not familiar Gwinnett. with Gwinnett. Yeah, was, there's not much. There, well, there wasn't much going on there when I was in eighth grade. But uh, right, right. that was kind of when I really got really into punk rock and hardcore. Um, mm -hmm. And... Uh, came back and we moved back into the neighborhood that I that we lived in that I grew up in and um, my best friend lived across the street and well actually he used to live across the street from me lived up the street showed up at his house and was like hey I moved back and uh, he had a guitar 
and he was like he had been taking guitar lessons and was like you know check it out man master of puppets you know stranger things <laughs> yeah and uh i was like you can do that i want to do that and then uh saved up some money and bought a really cheap guitar and then he started showing me stuff and then i started taking lessons and i was Oh, Absolutely. so you took so, so so you took you took lessons from a lo from a local person. I took lessons for about one summer, and the dude was just like, "I can't teach this kid anything," because <laughs> <Like, laughs> I did not care about theory yeah. or or like technique or anything. I was like, right. "How do you play this song? Show me how to play that song. I want to play yeah, punk." Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. and he was just like, "This kid doesn't care." But so me and my my best friend at the time, Mark. We were like, mm -hmm. we're going to start a band. And so, you know, we didn't, but we did spend a lot of time in his bedroom playing Metallica songs, which I butchered and he was good at. And, and lift lift was sort of the first, when, when you, when you, when you moved from there, lift was the first band and then, and then channel. Yeah. So lift was like, everybody has their high school band, you know? Sure. Sure. And it, it was really like, you know, you have a bass, you're in the band. You have drums, you're in the band. All right, we're Tell a band. Tell me about it. Tell <laughs> and, me uh, about it. Yeah. yeah. yeah sure. And so, but and, I mean, and, and, and also, and also, uh, you, uh, oh, oh, you have the loudest mouth, and and you talk, you talk the most. You're the singer. Yep, and that is 100 percent accurate in that case. Yeah. Uh, my my, I can testify best, to that. <laughs> yeah, in 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 high school, my best friend Jason, he was the singer, yeah. and yeah. Uh, yeah. Heckling and talking shit, so he was perfect. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, ch uh, channel, channel recorded, and you guys were the first release on Jamie Jasta's Stillborn label, right? I believe we were the first release. Um, how did how did you first release? How did you how did a band? How did you connect with Jamie? It was random, honestly. Like, uh, so we did our first show at this place called the King's Head Inn in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh -huh. um, pretty legendary uh, venue down there. Um, a friend of mine put the show together and was like, oh, I'm going to put you guys on. You can open. And it was uh, Channel, Dal or, who else? Just a 14. Oh, okay. Dive. And I can't remember who else was on the show. But J right. Just a 14 and dive played and uh yeah it was a great show and uh at the end of our set jamie just came up and introduced me and he was like i want to put your record out on my on my label and we were like really people do that fuck yeah let's do amazing. that amazing amazing yeah and that was that you know and still still friends hey, with jamie, jamie to this jamie's, day jamie's one of those guys man you know I mean, I, I mean, I'm a little bit older, you know. I, I was managing Marauder at the time at Fury yeah. Five, and you know, they'd go up and play Jamie's shows. And even as a young, very young person, Jamie was—he was an organizer. He—he he was a forward thinker. Uh, he was a great supporter and lover of music. And and you know, God bless, man. And people like very that. Very much so. Know, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think um, looking at especially like our era and people in my age group that play that play heavy music i think you'd be really hard pressed to find someone who did not who was not in some way helped by jamie along the way yeah. you know J jamie is an important figure in uh, in underground music for sure you know uh, in a lot of ways uh jamie reminds me of, of michael alago who who i did the documentary about uh you know, uh, who first and foremost is just, well, to tell the story, when I, when I, I when I went and met with the Lago and I was thinking about doing this film about him, um, I'm talking to him and I, I didn't know him all that well at that point. We toured together, you know, he signed the misfits and, 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 and we were on tour. And, but when I said, when he said to me, I just love music, it like really spoke to me. Like it, it just, it, all of a sudden I got it. It hit me like, like a diamond right between the eyes. Like I know who this kid is. This is the kid I went to public high school with in the Bronx. You know, I know that I got it. I can tell the story. I, I knew 
that, that, yeah. that I, I, I'm confident, like I know this person's heart and, 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 and I could tell that story. And, and I think, you know, someone that just is so passionate and loves music so much is, uh, it's like, I think it's a Jamie Jasta and, uh, there, there's a, there's, there's, it's a, you, it's a me, you know, we're out there, man. And it's a lot of people that watch this show, you know? You know, I, I think with people like that, it's evident right away. Yeah. You know, yeah. you, especially like with this stuff, but you know, there was like the idea of making a living doing this, like playing hardcore. It, it, yeah, it was, right. It, it's laughable. And yeah. like, it's insane to me that it's, it's a thing now, but like, which is great. Yeah. It's amazing. I, I, you know, but um, yeah. So when you meet somebody like that, especially at this point in life, it's like, you're not, you don't get to that point without having a deep love for all of this. Absolutely. Because you had to, you know, it, yeah. it, it, and you know, it, I'm sure you can relate like even back then when it was tiny and, you know, grassroots and there were 10 people at every show, like you could still see the potential, but at the same time, you know, the idea of it ever getting to the point, that it is now where like, yeah, you know, Hellfest is happening and there's, sure. you know, 60,000 people there and hardcore bands are playing on the main stage. Like that's mind blowing to me. Yeah. And, and, and there's a lot to learn there. You know, as, as a young teenager, when I fell in with the hardcore thing, I re vividly remember thinking that this is special and important and it should be documented. You know, that, that this yeah. is a moment, this is a moment in time that, that is special and important and, and, and it, there should be some sort of documentation of it. And, and even as a young person, that's something that I, you know, I, I, I tried to strive for. I mean, it, it, I, you know, took cameras to shows and tried to, you know, I, I thought that this was, this was, a, this was an important thing. And, you know, you know, just not to tie this, not to tie it back in, but you know, we were talking about like some Grateful Dead shit in the beginning of the show and yeah. the Grateful Dead came from that summer of love and that community. And as somebody that was involved with that community as a very young person, I connected the dots that this hardcore thing is a lot like this summer of love, hate Ashbury thing. It's community and culture and it's a Absolutely. youth and it's a youth movement and it's important and it should be documented. Yeah, well, I, I'm glad that people did document it, especially yeah. that like that first wave because I was I wasn't around for it, but I yeah, yeah. was obsessed with it and you yeah. know worshipped it, and so like I you know I had like the band band in DC. I would just sure. every day just looking at it, like looking at yeah, those yeah. photos, like whoa, look yeah, at that yeah. picture of the faith, you know, like yeah, uh, yeah, sure, a like boy. absolutely. Void is the most legendary band that ever existed, you know? I saw them a couple times, yeah. And, and, and Well, I'm jealous. Well, <laughs> I, I saw that show at fucking Gildersleeves when it came out, and the first song, he broke his leg. And then that was oh, the end of that. That's, came, came that's right an awesome out, show, broke, though. Came right that's out cool. and broke his leg, and that was the end of that. Can you beat that for a memory, though? That's incredible. Oh, God. Poor bastard. Yeah. You know, but, but, but that's... I'm not one of these kind of people that go on, you know, back in the day. And I hate that. I hate when people do that. You know, I was there and you weren't. I when, whenever somebody does pulls that shit, I'm like, just, I just, I, I almost shut off. It's, I mean, I'm, more, I'm just, I'm more interested. And, and, and listen, what we're doing is great here, but I think we can both agree. You know, what, what, what we're doing, we're about what's happening today and looking forward to, you know, looking forward to the future. And when people talk about the good times and back in the day, I feel bad for them because these are the good times. And, yeah. and this is what's happening right now, man. You know, I say it all the time, you know, like, yeah, I know. I'm sure so, you do, man. There's so yeah. much good music happening right now. That's and right. It's, That's it's right. like all you have to do is look for it. And, yeah. you know, yep. The thing is, is like when I hear people talking about that, exactly what you were just saying, I'm just like, dude, who cares? It yeah. does not matter what you think, man. Like what matters is what, you know, a 15 year old kid thinks today. That's right. Because, Daniel said because, the now. The yeah. Now. It doesn't, it doesn't 
belong to you. It belongs to them. And that's right. like what we do with it, that's it's ours. It's up to us and we can put it out there into the world, but like we're not the future, you know? Like they and, are. And, let and, the, and, it's and theirs. Let it become and all these young kids, man. You gotta let it evolve. And all these young kids that have their dreams and their aspirations, goddamn God bless. Good for them, man. That's yeah, what I, that's, I mean. And that's right, Hags. These are the good days. That's right, Hags. Right on. Right on. You know, it's it's like I hear all these dusty old farts complaining that, that yeah. they don't like turnstile. I'm like, so what? A, you're not in turnstile, so shut up. Yeah. B, like, it's not for you, dude. It was yeah. never for you. Like, it's it's for now. It's for the people that are into them now. And turnstile's fucking great so yeah they are dude yeah they are you don't have to go to the show this is interesting our friend james elliott elliott says everything gets sensationalized back in the day was the same as the now in 10 years they will sensationalize this too that's it is just it is just the ebb and it is just the ebb and flow of life isn't it (laughs) yeah everybody thinks that the era that they came up is the best era yeah it's like no that's just what you that's what is nostalgic for you and that's great be nostalgic but, you, but like but you know don't the, shit on what's happening now for sure but i think part of it is that you and i can afford to have that perspective because you and i are have things going on in the present you know i think well, sadly yeah. you have a lot of people that are sort of stuck in the past for whatever the reason but you know hopefully you know, well you know that, that, well, that i that, think that's true of everything not just music yeah, you know that, that's for sure Hey, tell us but, about this band here and, and what's going on uh, here. Let's let's move forward musically a little bit. All right. So uh, this is my band after channel. We were called Jesuit. Uh, this is at CBGB 97, wow. 98 maybe. Um, right. With who else played that show? Kiss a Goodbye played that show. Oh, nice. And um, yeah, it was it was a ripper. I had broken the headstock off of my Les Paul and that Gibson Melody Maker that I'm playing right there. Look at that little look at that little neck, huh? Yeah, <laughs> that belongs to Andrew Orlando from uh-huh. Black Army Jacket and Reservoir Records. He he loaned it to me kindly. And then he watched me play it at this show and he was scared out of his mind that I was going to destroy it because I was <laughs> flinging it around like an idiot. And uh, I'm sorry Andrew, but thank you. And you're a wonderful human being. I, I love I love the person on the right in the white with their fin- with their fingers in their ears getting hammered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were loud. So that oh, that's my friend Mandy, actually. Oh she boy. actually came with us to the show. Yeah. Boy, man boy, can- Mandy, you know, man Mandy, you know, they, they make they make they make uh you could put they make earplugs for that, Mandy, by the way. Yeah, well, you know. I didn't get hip to putting earplugs in until much, much later. And I don't think any of us did. Spe- speaking of which, how's, how's your hearing? What? How, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, I can hear, kind of. If yeah. we're in, like, if I'm in a restaurant with my wife and there's any kind of ambient noise and she's talking to me, I can't tell what she's saying. I, I've been fitted for hearing aids. I wear hearing aids now. Oh, how are they? Do they help? Yeah, they help. I'm getting used to them. I'm getting used to them. I'm not embarrassed. Listen, I, I as a very young person, I never wore earplugs. And I was in hardcore bands. Same. And, you know, I was up there, with, you know, right in front of the amps and, and all that as a young person. And I didn't wear, I, so, you know, I didn't wear earplugs as a young person and, and as a young man. Um, so I, my, my hearing is, is degenerative and it's getting worse and worse, but, but Hey, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. <laughs> that's why they make, the, that's why they make these things. <laughs> yeah. You're good. You're all set. Yeah. I mean, I, I wear plugs now. I started wearing earplugs probably about 10 years ago. Um, I've always had a little trouble wearing earplugs, um, as a singer, you know? Yeah. It, 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 it's, it, it's really hard to get. Yeah. around just hearing your head voice that's right and not that's hearing right. yourself from the monitor yep. um it you know it it's definitely a big learning curve to get through that uh um, so that was hard for me too what one thing we have on the show is there's a super chat and anybody that does a super chat kind of with a question they kind of go right to the front and the dillinger comp the dillinger compound asks 
Would Nate ever consider reforming Jesuit for shows? We did. Uh, we did two shows. Um, God, it was over a decade now, though, but uh, we played with Unbroken at Santo's Party House. And oh, wow. It was wow. an awesome show. Yeah, it was wow. a ripper of a show. And then we played Best Friends Day in Richmond um, with uh, the newly reformed uh, animosity lineup of COC. Mm. And it was it was fun. But I, you know, at this point, I, I I would not be opposed to it. But I think the amount of work that it would take to make it yeah, happen would sure. would be kind of difficult because we all live far apart. And sure. And here different. here's a Jesuit show um, at the Riverview at the Riverview Theater with Neurosis and Biohazard. What? Yeah, that so that was when Biohazard and Neurosis were on tour with Pantera, actually. Yeah. And that was an off show for them. And that's right. It's funny. I'm realizing this that I sent you this flyer, and I'm realizing after the fact that um, we got we got there and loaded in, and then the show started late, and they cut our set, so we didn't even get to play. <laughs> no shit. Yeah, but Neurosis was incredible that night, as always. Right. They're always incredible. Well, they were. I I saw a bunch of shows. Uh, you know, I was around then, and. Uh, that was a great tour, you know. Yeah. I, what year? What what? Um, uh, Hobo Cakes asked, "What year was this from?" Ninety six. Six. Ninety five. Yeah. Ninety six. Something like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. At eight dollars, what a deal! <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Isn't yeah. that crazy? Yep. But yeah, it was. I mean, I didn't. I didn't even care that we didn't play. I just was stoked. I got to see Neurosis for free. That's great. Because I didn't have eight dollars. <laughs> that's, that's awesome um let me see what else what is give me some perspective on this on i, lo I love i'm just obviously I'm, I'm just a sucker for the old flyer stuff man we we love it on the show yeah go for it uh, give, give give us some perspective on this so this was the first show that channel ever played out out of town uh it was mm -hmm. at uh what is this it was in dc at the old uh -huh. safari club oh yeah um, sure integrity ringworm didn't play bowel played uh lifetime channel just a 14 ended up jumping on and um yeah it was a ripper that, yeah. that was like my favorite lineup of integrity it was right right before systems overload came out so they were just fucking on fire it, it was a really great show I they was trying to dig around because I've got a bunch of pictures from this show, but I couldn't find them in time to send them to you because I was I slacked. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> it's okay, man. You you really you, you I know it came through at the last second, but you send me some real some real winners, man. And awesome. uh, certainly certainly appreciate that. Um, let me let me do a sponsor shout out for a couple minutes and and sure. sort of square away some business, and we'll come back and and let's talk about converge. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. See you in a few. Well, there you go. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Shout out Sunday. It's happening. Our guest today is Nate Newton from Cave In, Converge, Jesuit, Old Man Gloom. It's a good one. I feel good about it today, you know? I really do. Um, and I'm glad you're all out there with us today. We love doing the show. Uh, we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, the Texas Silver Rush, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Generation Records, 126 Hardcore Clothing, Grunge and Grimes Soap Company, and The Organic Grill. It's a vegan restaurant located, now located, in the West Village of New York City at 133 3rd Avenue, right in front of the Blue Note, right next to the Blue Note, excuse me. Featured in New York Magazine, New York Times, and the now legendary Veg News. Their dishes have won numerous awards, including Best Goddamn Veggie Burger. They make their own cheeses, sausages, circa sausages and burger patties and every dish on the menu can be made gluten-free this year they're celebrating the 23rd anniversary and they're all about having a great time while enjoying amazing clean food they have now fully reopened for business and look forward to seeing you yes you get in touch with them and order some great food at www.theorganicgrill.com also lest we forget generation records since 1992 generation records has been a mainstay of the new york metropolitan area music scene 
Today, they offer a diverse selection of new and used rock, jazz, indie, hip-hop, punk, hardcore, metal, blues, soundtrack, and reggae LPs, as well as T-shirts, posters, and other merchandise. They buy used record collections and music memorabilia and will pay you top dollar for them. House calls made for large collections in the tri-state area. Call or email generationrecords at gmail.com. Follow them on Facebook and on Instagram. I want to mention a couple of other things. The next, next four shows. The next, next four shows. Where are they? Hold on. Hold on. There's a conspiracy going on. There you go. The next, next four shows. There's going to be a Wednesday show this Wednesday. It's been a minute since we've done a Wednesday show. And I want to let you know that this Wednesday, we are we are now on Wednesday shows. We got Cat Popper coming up. There will be the Women of the Pit Spotlight, where they come on and talk about some new music out there, trying to get some new music incorporated into the show. They're going to do a little couple of minutes on every Wednesday. Um, continuing with Catherine Popper, the incredible bass player uh, who's coming up. Her work with Puss in Boots, Ryan Adams, Jesse Mallon, Grace Potter, Willie Nelson, and Jack White. Also, uh, John Gooseman, uh, the artist, the musician from Rule em All, Restless Spirit, Dead Last, and John the Movie. Sunday, July 31st, Don Foos will be on the show. I want to thank Don. Uh, he just sent me his, his new book. I got it. Motivate Me, a memoir of inspirational quotes, stories, and life lessons. So I will be uh, talking about this. He also sent me a bunch of CDs that I got to listen to. I still listen to CDs in the car. Uh, One Life All In, Lifeline, Run Devil Run, and The Spud Monsters. So looking forward to, looking forward to that. Also, um, Sunday, August 7th, you asked for it, you got it. Ross the Boss. Uh, Man of War, The Dictators, and Shaken Street. So that should be really, yeah, Foos is a good dude. Um, I've had him on talking boxing before. Um, it's going to be good. Um, so there you go. Um, sh- shout out, shout out to the r- the wrist rest. Is that an Apple product? Are you referring to? Let me see the wrist rest. I'm taking it at. Uh, hold on, let's get rid of this. Yeah, the wrist rest in question. I guess is that an Apple product? All right. It's all good. This is what it looks like. This is what I deal with. It's 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 uh it's not uh it's not rocket science, kids. This is a second screen. It, it's all from this. This is my, my the cheater keyboard um, from uh, from Final Cut uh, from my film editing. Uh, this is a big old Apple screen, and uh, the show's done on two screens. Everything is everything is is standing by on that screen, as you can see. Everything's lined up, and I move it over onto the big screen. Anyway. You know, not that it's a big secret, but there's a little, a little uh, perspective on on how we do it here. Also, you know, there, there there is no show coming up on a week from today because we have a Bowery Electric show. That's right, coming up a week from today on Sunday, July 24th. Get your shoes and socks on, kids. It is truly right around the corner. Sub Zero, brick by brick. Upstate New York represent Kings Never Die with Danny Schuler on drums from Biohazard and uh, Dan Nastasi of Doggy Dog on guitar, Larry the Hunter, Murphy's Law, great band, Dead True, Mad Mulligans. There will be a Pitchfork pop up show, DJ Sid the Kid. That's happening a week from today. So that is going down. Uh, that said, I think I think we got it. I think we got it covered. Oh, you know what? Let me mention one more show before we bring our guests back on. Um, Wednesday, August 10th. Talk about hard and heavy music. Mike Pooch from Sworn Enemy um, and Chris uh, Rafalowicz. They have a new project called See Through You. And uh, we're going to be talking about that. And, of course, you know, Mike, Sworn Enemy, Chris 
from uh, Shattered Realm. We'll be getting down with that too. That's Wednesday, August 10th. There you go. That said, let us let us bring our guest back on, Mr. Nate Newton. Hey, buddy. Hello. Hello. Good yeah. to be back. Yeah, man. Uh, let's talk a little converge. And uh, let's do it. How did how did that come to be for you? What were the circumstances leading up to you joining the band? Um, well, we met uh, actually. So the night that um, that I met Jamie Josta at that channel show, uh, Aaron Dahlbeck, who played in Converge at the time, he was roadieing for uh, for Dive. You know, the, the 90s yeah. version of roadieing for your friend's band where you just rode in the car and didn't do anything. Sure. Yeah, well, we all hey, a, lot, a, a lot of great a lot of great careers started uh, in that role, you know. <laughs> Very true. Very true. Yeah. So um, I met Aaron uh, that night and he was like, oh, you got to check out my band Converge. And he actually gave me a copy of uh, I, Halo in a Haystack had just come out on vinyl and he mm -hmm. gave me a copy. And I was like, whoa, this is awesome. And um, yeah, we just kind of started a, a, a friendship that way. I mean, you know, just everybody who plays in a hardcore band has a million stories just like that. Sure. Um, and uh, so we did a show up in Massachusetts where we drove straight from Virginia Beach all the way up and uh, played a show to like 20 people. And I think Converge was five of those people. And um, yeah, we just became friends ever since. Uh, then we booked our first, both of our first tours together, Converge and Channel. Uh, we did an East Coast tour. And we're just friends ever since. Um, Jesuit toured with Converge. And then, uh, like, after Jesuit got, like, really busy touring and everything, uh, Converge was just about to release When Forever Comes Crashing. Steve Brodsky, who um, also obviously plays in Cave-In and now Quicksand and yep. um, Old Man Gloom with me, you know, a mil Mutoid Man, a million other bands. But he, he was playing bass in Converge at the time. But Caven was about to release until your heart stops, and they were um, they were ready to start hitting it hard. And so he was like, "I can't do this anymore." Uh, so Converge needed someone to fill in on bass for their U.S. tour for When Forever Comes Crashing, opening for Today Is the Day. And I was like, "I hate my job." Uh, Let's go. Let's do it. I'll I'll do this. And so I went up to Massachusetts three days before the tour starts. I didn't own a base. We went walked over to Mr. Music a couple of blocks yeah, from yeah, where yeah, Kurt you, lived. You, you, did, you, you didn't own you, you didn't own a base because you were a guitar player and that yeah. just, and and they said we need a bass player. You're playing you know and you said, Okay, bass. Yeah, I was like, it's got it's only got four strings. Can't yeah, be that sure. much harder. I could do yeah, that. That's that's right. Of it's just, it's the same, right? So uh, yeah, we went on that tour, and um, that yeah, we bought went and bought a bass with the band fund at uh, Mr. Music in Alston, and then I went back to Kurt's house, and he was like, "All right, what song do you want to play?" And I was like, "I don't I don't know how to play any of your songs," <laughs> and he was like, "What?" And uh, so then I had to learn their whole set in uh, three days, and then we went on tour, and I don't think I learned their whole set for like a year. Probably, but uh, I just jumped around and acted like an idiot, which leads us to this photograph right yeah, here. Tell us about uh, this. That's at, the, that's at the Melody Bar in uh, New Brunswick, New Jersey. Um, I don't know if it was the la last, no, it wasn't the last day of the tour, but it was close to the end of the tour. Uh, and very first song of the set, we just, you know, we were on a mission. We're going to rip it up, dude. And I, I, uh, I'm going off. And so like my move, you know, I had like a distortion pedal on my bass and it sounded gnarly. My move was, I would like punch the bass to make like a loud, stupid noise that just sounded horrible. And, uh, I, so I went like that. And when I did it, it just popped up in the, uh, the upper bout of the bass, like where all the duct tape is 
hit me square in the eye and split my eyebrow open from here to here, all the way to the bone. And, uh, oh. yeah. And it, first song, just blood everywhere. That's, that must've been like right after it happened. And, um, yeah, then played the whole set, had no idea where I was or what was going on. And then, um, uh, Pat from, uh, he played in, shattered realm back then and now he plays in fit for an autopsy he he like grabbed me and he was like dude are you okay and i'm like yeah what and he was like get in the car now and he just took me straight to the hospital and got me stitched up and uh it's it's it's, it's, it's really epic that that it was that the, the, the moment was captured like this yeah i someone sent me that photo like much later and i was like no that's, way that's you've got that that's incredible great. that's really great yeah yeah, you know, so I then saw, that night, yeah, um, yeah. Oh, that night, uh, Pat took me over to Ben Weinman's house from Dillinger Escape Plan, and now plays in Suicidal Tendencies. And uh, I stayed at Ben's house, and his mom like made up a guest room for me, and I covered the the like the the whole thing was just covered in blood from my face. And I oh, woke man. up the next morning, and I was like. Oh, uh, I kind of ruined your <laughs> your guest room. I'm sorry, and but they were really cool about it. But yeah, you know, cool. you, you know, one thing we didn't touch on is, and 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 correct me if if this is if I'm wrong on this, but when you when when Jesuit sort of um, when you guys kind of moved on, Brian joined the Dillinger Escape Plan, right? He did, yeah. So Brian went on to play. I think he played on two uh, Dillinger albums, maybe. Th Maybe the three, the one with Mike Patton as well. So it was just like a general um, sort of like we're 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 moving on. Everybody's sort of seeking other pastures. Um, yeah, I guess in retrospect, yes. Uh, yeah, we, I you know, I can say with a lot of confidence that that time in my life, I was, I was not in a good place mentally, and like. I was like hyper focused on like, you know, trying to relive getting the van. You know, it was yeah, like right. we're touring nonstop. We're never going to yeah. stop. We're going we're hard work, going. hard hard work, and work ethic pays off. And and we have to suffer. We have yeah. to suffer to make. Yeah, I've been there. Yeah, I killed the band basically. Like no one wanted to do that, and I don't blame them. And uh, guys just, like you, guys like you, bro. It's just like, we have to, we have, you don't understand. We have to go and travel, you know, three days to play some shitty bar in the middle of nowhere. Like, yep. Uh. Yep. Did a lot of that. <laughs> yep. Here's your $20 yep. for playing that show. Yeah. Uh, how dare you I don't you know complain. how you're getting home. Bye. Uh, what do you mean? What do you mean you yeah, have a job? we did a lot of that. <laughs> what do yeah. you mean you have a job or a girlfriend? How dare you? you you're no. not willing to do what it takes. <laughs> These stupid bands, the, these dumb songs we write are more important than anything else in your life. So, yeah, that was <laughs> I, I killed the band. 100 percent killed the band. And um, but also I knew that I wanted to keep doing it and sure. find other like minded sure. indiv individuals. And sure. Brian was the same. And, you know, uh, we we had gone on tour with Botch and actually took Dillinger out on their first tour. They were opening the tour. And um, they immediately recognized that Brian was a much better guitar player than than me. And uh, they were like, hey, uh, you know, we're, we're going to need a second guitarist. Do you want to join the band? And so he was like, hell yeah. And so he did it. And, and then it just kind of fell into place with Converge. And here I am. They never, Converge never officially asked me to join. I'm st I, So technically, I think I'm still filling in. <laughs> um this uh magnus uh did a um did a super chat um is, is he swedish what is that what is sec is that chronos uh yeah, yeah. kroners yeah he, i wonder i wonder what 100 kroners is in dollars it's probably 30 it's probably it's probably three dollars but i have but no idea you, but but thank you bro um Rest in peace, uh, Caleb Schofield, Caven, Old Man Gloom, etc. Check out Zazobra, his own project. The album, the album's harmonic tremors and Bird of Prey are just monstrous and beautiful. 
And any any perspective on that for us? I mean, I agree with him 100%. Those records mm. are fantastic. Uh, Caleb was the ultimate riff machine. Like mm -hmm. the dude, every time, especially in old man and gloom, because, you know, I played music with him for 20 years in that band. Right. Um, every time I thought I had something cool, I'd be like, check out this riff I wrote. And he'd be like, yeah, that's cool. I, I got a couple here. Check this out. And I'd be like, fuck what, fuck what I wrote. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you just made me look like an idiot. Sure. Um, yeah. But yeah, Zozobra was just incredible, man. They were such a good band. Uh, uh, Dan says harmonic tremors is brilliant. Was you know what? I I I have to get acclimated to this. Uh, harmonic a tremors is brilliant. Record. Was listening to it yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. He, he that one that came out. You know, Old Man Gloom had been together for a little while, but we were sort of inactive at the time. And Cave In, you know, that was always Caleb's main band. But at, sure. at Cave In started being inactive as well. And so he put out the Zazobra record and I just, I was fucking floored when I heard that record. I couldn't believe how good it was. I, I was, it, you know how like you hear a record as a musician and it makes you jealous? Like that was, that was that record. I was like, fuck, I suck. <laughs> you know, there's just some people that are just inherently gifted, you know? That was... That was Caleb, one hundred percent. And and I must say, it's it's fairly pretty rare for somebody who's uh, gifted in that regard, and who doesn't befall the pitfalls of life, and who actually is able to be proficient with their art. I've seen been around many, many, many incredibly talented, gifted people who have squandered uh, their their ability due to drugs and alcohol, or 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 this or that or the other thing. But uh, it, it is, I must say, it is pretty rare that someone is really uh, artistically gifted and, and really have the, the work ethic and the ability to execute it. Yeah. You know, and beyond the work ethic, the kind of mental and emotional stability to, yes. to maintain right. it. You know, that's, I, yeah, that, yeah. I think that's the thing that, that a lot of people lack. Um, yeah. And that, that's not a bad thing or a good thing. It's just, you know, some people are able to and some people aren't. And that's okay. But, um, you know, like kind of to your point, you know, I've had numerous people, you know, say things to me about, you know, any one of my bands like, oh, you guys are so good. Like, it's just, you know, it's, you're like the best band that's ever done this, or, and, which I'm like, that's, well, that's not true. But also like, you know, we're lucky. We're just lucky. There are a million incredible musicians out there who just for one reason or another, couldn't get hurt, you know? And so, you know, I just remind myself of that all the time, just how fucking insanely lucky I've been to kind of slide into the position where I am. And, you know, it's I not like I'm getting rich or anything, but I'm really, really thankful that I've found myself in a position where I can continue creating music. Well, I commend you because I, I personally feel that a lot of that is just your inherent uh, work ethic. And, and, and that, that's a big part of it. You have a good work ethic. And, and, I, and, and I learned a, a while back, and, and I learned this from Biohazard when I worked with them, because I never saw anything like this until I worked with them in the, in the early 90s, uh, is just if you have a work ethic and you stick to it and you're committed and you work hard, something good will come out of it. And, 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 you know, if you stay the course and, and, and you have, and, and you work and, and you don't freak out and you don't pull the pin out of the grenade and you don't turn on each other, which happens all the time in bands, you know, if you don't yeah. turn on each other for Christ's sake, you know, you could do big things, you know? So, yeah. I mean, th th that's the hardest part is lasting long enough that you yeah. get to a point where everything is just works, you know? Yeah. Um, and I mean, you learn a lot about yourself and about other people when you start touring, you know, yeah. you, you learn really, really quickly who's cut out for it. Yeah. Like who's cut out to be in a working band and who is, yeah. um, I mean, and you know, it's true about work ethic, but I mean, I'm, I'll stress it again. Luck is massive because there are yeah. so many incredible hardworking bands out there that just mm -hmm. never, 
got the the recognition they deserved. So uh, uh, this know. is a more recent um, cave-in photo. Yeah, you can tell by my old man beard. Right. <laughs> and and this ties in with this which is upcoming cave-in shows, correct? Yep. So that's our European tour that's happening in October. But actually later this week, uh, we start a U.S. tour with right. Author and Punisher. I have that as well. Let me find that. Um, it's in there somewhere. Sorry, I yeah, sent you just a jumbled mess of stuff. I apologize for that. No, I, I got it. I got I got the... Uh... I got the, 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 uh, hold on. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Cool graphics, man. I like, I like the graphics. I like the graphics on this. Here you go. Come on. Come there on. You go. Spinning wheel. Oh yeah. That's the album cover. Um, yeah, really cool. So that, thank you. That, uh, artwork, it's all hand drawn by uh, Richie Beckett and he just, hit a home run man every time i look at that artwork i'm like holy shit that is incredible and this is coming up uh this is coming up in new york city on the 22nd it is yeah i gotta see where the hell am i the 22nd i i think i want to come down <laughs> please do i would love it yeah yeah i, I gotta let me, let me look i, I want to I wanna see that yeah I'll, I'll check it out um you know, let's talk about this a second because this, 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 this I found very interesting. Um, what's oh going on here? <laughs> so <laughs> that is me. That's me holding Erivan's bass that uh, he used on, I believe, Danzig one, or may, no, mm -hmm. yeah, Danzig one and in Sam Hain maybe. Um, mm -hmm. So, my friend. Uh, Dave, who uh, does Six Feet Under Records and is in Blacklisted, um, he is the ultimate collector, and um, he acquired Erivan's bass, and he told me that he had it, and so we were working on, oh, which Converge record were we working on when he told me that he had it? Um, I think it was All We Love, We Leave Behind. Mm. Um, and, uh, yeah, I was like, you have it, you have that base. And he, he's like, yeah, man. And I, I'm like, bring it the fuck over here because I'm using it on the record. And so is I that used an it area, on a Is songs. that an area? Is that an area pro Mark yeah. two? It is. Yeah. So that base for me, I mean, I'm a huge Danzig and Misfits fan yes. and, um, yep. but that base in particular for me like holds a special place in my heart because one of the very first issues of Thrasher magazine I ever owned, it had a whole article. Um, I can't remember who wrote it, but these guys went on a, on a skate and music road trip where they were just going to shows every night and skating. And one of the photos was of Danzig at city gardens. And, um, you know, Danzig's doing his, his move. And yeah. then, Sure. Eerie is Eerie is right up front, fucking in this sick rock pose, holding that bass, and I just remember looking at that bass like that is the fucking coolest bass guitar I've ever seen, and then holding it in my hands and getting to play it, just unbelievable, you know. And I wish uh, I I wish I had some other photos because the back of it all hand painted uh -huh. by Eerie with like the the skull and like the Sam Hain got like it's so fucking awesome. I, I have to say that um, uh, Dillinger said, Compound says John Taylor of Duran Duran played with an area. Cliff Burton played one. And I have to say that here is, hold on. Doesn't here, Harley? Here. I think Harley Flanagan played one too. An area? Yeah, I thought he had one. Here is a shot of me in 1990-91 during the rock years. On stage with my area pro mark. Tour. Yes. There yes. you go. Uh, with my area pro, which I still have. Dude, look at all I, that hair. Yeah, man. Yeah. You look cool. 
Yeah, yeah. This was the during the rock. This was during the antidote rock era. I and, like it. Uh, and um, I still have this bass. You, you know, you know, you know who played this bass that, that got me going on it? Rudy Sarzo was playing was playing an area. Oh, and, nice. And, 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 and that and that got me and that got me uh, to it. Okay. Just being here says more Danzig stories. I, I got a quick Danzig story for you. Uh, Tell me that, a Danzig story. This, I'm ready. This, this, this is a cool one. Uh, you know, having been around during the first wave of American hardcore, uh, having seen the Misfits and, and played on this, you know, when I was in the High and the Mighty, we played with the Misfits and I, you know, uh, you know, before, before the Misfits uh, uh, split up, you know, at the channel in Boston, oh, uh, the High and the Mighty played with them. I was friends with Jerry uh, and Doyle. And when I joined Antidote, you know, Arthur Googie, who plays on Walk Among Us was the drummer. So when I joined Antidote, you know, uh, Googie was the drummer and all that. When I joined Antidote in, in 80, 84 or whatever. But I had a job. I was the stage manager at Riverview, at Riverview Stage uh, in Astoria, Queens in 87, 88, 89. I was the stage manager. And as part of being the stage manager, I was the liaison, uh, you know, to production companies that were coming in onto the stage. Well, one day, you know, uh, I, I, this this production company comes in, and and usually when, when you, uh, you you deal with the production company, oh, they're doing a music video. I don't really ask what you're doing, what the music video is. But one day, you know, they, they come in, and sure enough, on my little stage in Astoria, Queens, uh, they shot uh, Danzig Mother, and uh, what? The, the, the 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 mother video. Wow! And it, it was and and it was a big thrill for me because Chuck Biscuits was playing drums, Dude. and you know, being a very early DOA fan, you know, um, uh, I was just Chuck Biscuits was a was a big deal to me, and 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 Glenn, you know, and and Glenn was was you know very nice then, and and I spoke to Glenn, but what what I do remember from from the Danzig Mother video was and, and i guess this exists maybe you would know but i think they did sort of a like i don't say an x-rated version but is there a version with nudity of that video because i remember they did the, the 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 girls or whatever i think they i remember they cleared the stage and cleared the room because they were doing sort of they did a version with 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 boobies and stuff and really uh, there, yeah there was a bunch of nakedness uh wow so they cleared, i've never so, seen that yeah, maybe maybe it doesn't. Maybe it never saw the light of day. Um, oh, I'm on a mission now. I got to see that. Yeah, um, not the second mother video. The second mother video that came years later when they had the they had a surprise hit with the song "Mother" because it was on that that lot on that live. That was years after after the first record. You know. Yeah, that was that was like '90, I think. Yeah, yeah, it was it it yeah. was it was it was years. Yeah, Justin says. Yeah, I think there's. He says I think there's one with nudity. But 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 that was. Uh, but that that was very cool. And and it also you know later on I was the stage manager uh, at three G stage for many years. And that's where we we ended up. You know uh, when I left there, I was still I'm still and to this day connected with the people uh, of that film stage. Um, we shot the Biohazard video there. We shot Typo Negative Black Number One there. Uh, you know we did salt. So, you know awesome. that I was that I was involved, but suicidal tendencies came onto that stage, and they did that video. Give me, send me your money. I think. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, and that was a big thrill because I loved suicidal. I love suicidal tendencies. Yeah, man. Um, here's 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 a question from yeah, the Dillinger I, I saw suicidal one time. Is that right? Um, oh yeah, uh, shoot it. Is Caven doing any Canadian dates? Um. Not at the present moment, but that's not saying that we won't in the near future, but uh, mm -hmm. we don't have any booked or announced at the moment. We yeah. will. I promise. I promise. And, and, and this, this whole thing, which I'm, I'm, I don't want to, I, I, I don't want to play the music and get it flagged, but this, this is gearing up to go out in September, right? Yep. That's going to be here, a ripper. Here's a little taste. That's all you get. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty much that whole song, anyway. Yeah. That that Mashuga song. <laughs> um, if you can, if you can count the time signature in that, uh, you're a genius. <laughs> <laughs>
because I can't. <laughs> yeah. Here's the um, – here's the – I get – this is a pretty. Uh, this is a. This is a. This is a nice stretch, huh? Yeah, we're not doing the whole tour though. We're only doing. Oh, I see. The, the first half. Um, I see. You're, you're going through I, the I 30th, wish, through Minneapolis. Yeah, I wish we could have done the whole thing, but it just wasn't possible, unfortunately. Cool. But yeah, it's going to be a ripper. I'm really looking forward to it. I've actually never seen Meshuggah before. Torch is one of my favorite contemporary bands, and I. I am believe- not familiar with them. Oh, they're fantastic. Like the perfect right? the perfect mixture of heaviness and melody. Um like yeah, they're they're great. And I think it's going to be their last tour unfortunately. Uh I'm I think that uh Steve, their their vocalist and guitarist is calling it quits, which is a bummer cuz I love them. Huh. That is that's that's cool. Um let me think uh let me let me take uh, my last sponsor break and uh, a little shout out and let's come back and and we'll take some questions from around the world. See you in a minute. Sounds good. There you go. This is the one, the only often imitated, never duplicated. Clank your chains and count your change. The New York Hardcore Chronicles live. And we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics. The Organic Grill, Generation Records, The Texas Silver Rush, 126 Hardcore Clothing, Grunge and Grime Soap Company, and DTFM Vinyl Distro. It's a record store that specializes in underground music, punk, ska, hardcore metal, and more. Located in the heart of Fargo, North Dakota's Industrial District, shop in person or online at www.dtfmvinyldistro.com, where the motto is, Death to False Metal. Come on now, our most beloved sponsor, New York Hardcore Comics, opened back in 2013 when lifelong friends Debo to Pro and Lee Fairley combined their collections and obsessions for comic books, punk rock, toys, and statues, Magic the Gathering, and all things horror. The store is located at 117 Main Street in Dobbs Ferry, New York, open seven days a week and shipping worldwide. Contact them via email at New York Hardcore Comics at gmail.com or at www.newyorkhardcorecomics.com. Want to introduce to you a new sponsor who's come aboard. This is DeWolf Publishing. And we want to, we're going to also get hip to something that they have going on. But let's say hi to DeWolf Publishing. They're a completely independent publishing house formed by authors Amy Yates Wolfing and Stephen. D. Lodovico in Philadelphia in 2014. To date, they have released five books with widely ranging topics, including graffiti culture, Amer- American ska and reggae, punk zine culture, and soon to be published memoir of Adrenaline OD. Their mission is to preserve and curate subculture and its history. Get your face out of that phone and into a book, www.dewolf.com. I want to mention that dewolf.com, their book, uh, if this is Tuesday, it, this must be Walla Walla, the wacky history of Adrenaline OD uh, is, uh, is up for pre-sale now. I'll get you the link. Um, they are Adrenaline OD is playing their first show in New York City in seven years at the Bowery Electric on Friday, November 4th. Tickets are on sale now. The last time they played New York, played New York sold out. Uh, Fear Gods is on the bill. And, and we are playing Incendiary Device ID. We are on the bill as well. So this is Adrenaline OD. This is our new sponsor, DeWolf Publishing. So there you go. Uh, yes, Adrenaline OD. Um, that said, want to let you also want to hip you to. Oh, yes. You know, speaking, of, uh, speaking of this Fakakta band that I'm in who are waiting for me in the recording studio right now. It's where I'm going after this, the recording studio. I don't, you know what? I hate the recording studio. I really do at this point. It's like, let me know when I have to come and do my part and I'll come in. Fucking recording studio gets me nuts. Um, uh, Incendiary Device, we're playing August 12th, Friday, August 12th. We are playing upstate New York with Cropsy, Downswing, Wrong Move, Death Before Dishonor and Mad Bill. Mad Mad Bill. It's a Mad Bill. 
Madball uh, at the Empire Underground in Albany, New York. And yeah, these guys just sent me this picture uh, as I was doing the show. So this is what I'm looking forward to when the show is over. I will be dealing with these clowns who are obviously putting in the work that is needed out in Brooklyn. I will be heading over there to do so incendiary devices doing our record um, even as we speak. Do you know that Rampage Fest 4, the date has been announced? It is, of course, Sunday All Ages Free Matinee. November 13th, that is Rampage Fest 4 at the Bowery Electric. If it's free, it is truly for me. If you're thinking about, yo, how can I support this show? Uh, maybe preach to the converted a little bit, but there is a Patreon page. We do special private Patreon shows. Um, come be a patron. Please uh, support this show. Um, hold on. Nature sent me a picture. Let me see. Let me get, uh, someone just sent him a picture. So let me download that. Let's see. We do all this shit in real time, you know? Um, oh, all right. That's a cool shot. We, I got that, Nate. Um, so yeah, there's a Patreon page, AJ. Hey, Brett the Bookie, what's up? What's happening, man? We, we still got to get you on the show, Brett. It's my neighbor, Brett the Bookie. Um, let me see. Yes, Rampage Mosh Crew is is Rampage Mosh Fest is happening. Um, did I cover everything else? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Let's bring our guests back on. Hey, um, if you have any questions, please feel free uh, to post them, and we will ask our guest, Mr. Nate Newton. Hey, man. Hi. Hi. Um, let me find, <laughs> hi, let me find that question, uh, that, that photo you just sent me. Hold on. It's a good, nice shot. Looks oh like yeah. It going, the... Looks like, looks like it was going off. What's happening here? Uh, that's me punching that same base that hit me in the eye, but that time it didn't hit me in the eye. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's at the, uh, the London garage in 90 oh, oh no that's that's the london garage oh the garage the garage, the garage in london but uh yeah. yeah tom thomas hooper took that photo and uh he was he was watching the show right now and he just emailed it or he just texted it to me i was like no way that's amazing so i had to share it that's and cool. uh yeah Thanks it's funny that. like thomas and i years later became really good friends i had no idea that he was right up front at that show taking pictures oh our 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 friend and supporter uh vault says i was there yeah you were that's cool man <laughs> you and yeah. four other people yeah, yeah well, he's, <laughs> well yeah, he's a he's a london guy you know so he, he, he's and, and he has a question he says i heard a lot of comparisons back in the late 90s uh between you guys and catharsis although not sounding alike did you ever play with them um I'm sure we did. I, I don't know if I don't recall Converge and Catharsis ever playing together, mm -hmm. but you know, bear in mind that whole time frame is just a blur to me because you know I was constantly on the move. But um, Jesuit definitely played shows with Catharsis, and is that right? Yeah, and um, Brian, who sang for Catharsis, uh, did a record label called crime think and i think that crime think still exists in in some form but he put out a, a compilation lp that featured jesuit actually um so yeah in, in a roundabout way yes Play i want to i want to thank uh, uh home uh who who sort of is bringing this to the party did i miss nate talk about doom riders three great albums um Doom Riders, uh, you sing and play guitar, and we sort of we that sort of slipped through the cracks. Can you give us a little perspective on Doom Riders? Uh, yeah, uh, that kind of just started uh, organically. Like um, honestly, but before I moved to Massachusetts, I had become friends with Chris Papecki from uh, Cast Iron Hike, and we uh, just whenever they would come through town or my my bands would come through through Massachusetts like 
we would end up just shooting the shit and talking about music and it just turned out we were really into a lot of the same stuff and it you know wasn't necessarily stuff that other hardcore kids we knew were into um and so uh yeah we just when i finally moved up to massachusetts in 99 we started jamming together and it took took a few years but we eventually like put a lineup together and uh made it happen and basically we were just like we just want to sound like thin lizzy and motorhead and you know mixed with hardcore and do you, uh, do you do you and it, it's isn't it i mean i guess it's a, a little bit different approach you're, you're you're playing guitar and singing yeah it's a very different approach you know yeah. like i went from wanting to write like the craziest heaviest riff to like yeah yeah all right i need to write actual catchy song and uh, it was a big learning curve for me because i've never been a great guitar player and chris is just an absolutely fantastic guitar player. And so I, I, I learned a lot from him and, you know, really just honed my chops at trying to write actual songs instead of piles of riffs, you know? Sure. Um, uh, G- yeah. And it's kind of inactive at the moment, but that's. Yeah. G- GP asks any plans to resurrect doom writers. I saw that great show you played with turbo Negro at the house of vans in Brooklyn. Oh, thanks. That was a fun one. Um, yeah, I, bet. I bet they're a fun band. Oh, yeah. It was, that was a great show. Um, yeah. I mean, it's we're kind of inactive at the moment, but it's not because the band is, is done. It's just yeah. uh, we were, like, starting to write a new record, and then the pandemic hit, and then, like, you know, people have – kids and lives and other bands and uh you know i'm dumb and keep saying yes to things and then <laughs> don't have time to uh d- I, I don't have the proper time to uh really focus on it but i'm i miss doing shows with doom riders and i really want to get back to it cool robert hogg our, our good friend and supporter in scotland says hi nate i'm hoping you guys can eventually make it back to scotland I saw you guys in Glasgow many years ago, and it's still one of the most explosive live gigs I've been to. And he sent me this photo. I'm assuming it's from that show. Uh, it's a little little out of focus, but you 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 could you could feel the energy. Oh yeah, yeah. I remember that show. Um, yeah, yeah, I remember that show because behind me on the stage there was a roof leak, and water was just pouring in. And there, there were like all like the power stuff was back there, and our TM was freaking out trying to get it all, all off the <laughs> ground so that it didn't light up. But yeah, like every show we played in Scotland has been great. Um, great. We played another one. I, the one that really sticks out in my mind is we played. It's, it's, it was a venue. I think it was called Barfly, maybe. And there was an upstairs venue, and it was like it was a daytime show. And we played, it was kind of like, it was like a coffee house and it was just a madhouse. And we were upstairs and the exploited were playing downstairs. Oh and boy. I, and I went downstairs to watch the exploited cause I was fucking stoked, you know? Wow. And I got down there and like, you know, like those old movies, you know, in the seventies where like the square guy walks into the biker bar and, yeah, and, and, and everything, just, and everything just stops. Yeah. I walked in and I was like, these people are going to kill me. I'm afraid. What the fuck is going on in here? <laughs> but then then, uh, then the exploited started playing uh, Death Before Dishonor. And I was like, I don't care! <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, and then I went back up to our show. So uh, Heggs asks, um, how, how did working with the Cavalera conspiracy come about? And... Of course, he's he's turning. He's talking about uh, the Pandemonium record. He's talking about the Pandemonium record, which uh, you did some co-lead vocals on the song Crucible, right? I did, and I played bass on that. Right, record. you played bass on the whole record, right? Tell us about yeah. how this came about. Well, listen, you know, uh, uh, Igor and Max have been on the show. They're they're big supporters of the show. We love those guys. They're fantastic human beings, yeah. um, dude. It was the most random thing ever. Like I. <laughs> Seriously, this is how it went down. I was on tour with Doom Riders, 
we had just played a show in Columbus, Ohio, I think. Like uh -huh. j literally just gotten off the stage. It was it was Doom Riders and Full of Hell. And um we had ju just gotten off stage and loaded the van. It was literally like 1.30 in the morning, getting ready to drive to a hotel. Or no, we were staying at our friend's house that night. And we, we were getting ready to drive to our friend Ryan's house. My phone rings and I'm like, the fuck is this number from Arizona? Is this a prank call? What is this? You know, I answer it, and it, which is weird because I usually never answer a number that I don't know. Was it Gloria or Max? It was Gloria. And, <laughs> but so I answer it and I'm like, hello? And, and she's like, is this Nate? Yeah. Who's, is this? This is, this is Gloria Cavalera. And I'm like, how in the, f well, first, I'm like, bullshit. And, <laughs> and she's like, no, this is Gloria Cavalera. I was calling because, um, you know, Max really loves Converge and wanted to know if you wanted to play bass on a Cavalera conspiracy record. And I, wow. I still was like, fuck you. This, who the fuck is this? Like, <laughs> I don't believe this shit. Who's fucking, who the fuck you? Click. <laughs> wow and then she called back and was like no seriously this is glorious this is gloria cavalera and wow. i was like uh i'm sorry <laughs> and, and uh yeah that was it just cold so, call so i don't you, even so know you, i don't know how she got my number so you just came in on a studio project and 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 Dude, worked up the worked up the songs with max and nope nope they sit so they were working, they were doing the record out in Arizona. I couldn't go because my daughter had just been born and I also had like another tour coming up. And so it was like, I, I can't, I can't leave. Uh, I was like, you know, can you send me <laughs> some demos? Yeah. Can, it's for real. I'm not even joking. And I was like, wow. can you send me some demos for the songs? And she was like, oh, we don't have any. And I was like, for real? And so um, I, yeah. Book some time with my friend Chris Johnson, who now plays bass in Doom Riders and also plays bass in Deaf Heaven at uh, Q Division. And uh -huh. uh, I was like, hey, I need a day, uh, you know, in um, in at, at the studio to come record some bass tracks. And he was like, all right, what are we recording? And I'm like, I don't know. I literally don't know. So they sent me the tracks on a Friday and I was going in on Monday, but I got the flu. So I was like sick as fuck puking all weekend, never listened to the tracks, nothing. Oh. And then I, then I get up Monday morning and I'm like, fuck, I guess I got to go record this record that I've never heard. And I just went into the, the so, studio. So they, they, and, uh, they, they had it. They had Chris it. Was like, what? They had it. Guitar drums was, was Riz, was our boy Rizzo playing on it? Yeah. Yeah. We had yeah. everything. Like except yeah, for yeah. bass and bass and vocals weren't done yet, and wow. so uh, yeah, they sent me the the tracks and I just went into the studio and Chris was like, "What do you, what song do you want to start on?" And I was like, "Well, I don't know any of them, so let's start out the first one <laughs> and uh, just played through them right there, just, learned just them on sort, the spot, just sort recording. of just sort of like rolled up your sleeves and just and just got with it, right? And just learned, yeah, just hey, you do it once, you do it twice." You do it a third time, the fourth time you got it, right? Yeah, that, that was pretty much it. And yeah, uh, yeah, sure. Did, did them all in a day, and yeah. then uh, went back the next day and did the vocals. Which, like Max was like, from this time, this, for, you know, from this time stamp to this time stamp. And I'm like, what do you want me to sing? And he just sent me these lyrics that there, there was like, there was no way that they were all fitting in there. And I was like. You want me to sing all these lyrics? He's like, nah, just do what you want. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so yeah, that's Max, what is, I did. Max is good like that, you know? Yeah, they were really cool, man. Like, I just, I was like, I hope you guys like what I did here. And I sent it back to them. And they were like, yeah, this is awesome. And I'm like, well, that was the easiest thing I've ever done, pretty much. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a similar experience with them. I'm trying to, I'm trying, oh, here it is right here. So back in whenever it was, I guess it was 95, 96, um, when I was working with Paris Mayhew and, you know, and we were doing all the videos, uh, Gloria gets in touch with us and they say, we want to cut, you know, back then on, we want you, we want to do like a, like a VHS, like a home video, not a, it was a home video, like a video release thing. Right. 
she sends me a box of tapes that they were that they were shooting, like a, just a box of tapes, and we basically wrestled it and turned it into this. Amazing. Yeah, I me didn't know you did that. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. And uh, we basically they sent a box of fucking tapes, like you know, <laughs> and, and and no, no we, direction, just, just here, do something nothing, with this. Nothing. And and I and I just started being, you know, I just transferred everything started looking at everything and and we booked like a month a month in like an edit bay and you know Paris Mayhew very talented uh you know in, in the edit room the guy had an incredible focus uh a, a, as an editor uh, you know he really you know he he really put the he really put the thing together as as I produce it let me see if I have a picture of the of the back of it um that's incredible, man. What a great But it was story. the same thing. They sent me a fucking box of tapes. Right? You know? It was like, yeah. what the fuck? You know? Yeah, literally. I was like, do you have any demos? No. No? Here's, here's the tracks on a Friday. You're recording Monday. I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> yep, here it is. Here I got it. This is both the... But it was rad. Video. I was super stoked. And Oh, another funny thing was... Um, there it is. I'm sorry. She there, was there's like, the oh, front, there's oh, the yeah, front nice. in the back. You could see up top, directed by Paris Mayo, produced by Drew Stone for Stone Films NYC, edited by edited by Heather. I don't know who that is. Heather Lopez. Oh, Hector Lopez. Uh, Paris Mayo and Drew Stone at LA Post. Oh, we we cut it. Oh, that's right. We cut that in LA. Right. Amazing. Yeah, Amazing. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's go ahead. so cool, man. Yeah. Igor with all that hair. Look at him. Yeah, man. Looking good. Love those guys. But, fun, yeah. Another funny thing. Thing that happened was you know uh gloria was like um you know oh max wants to talk to you a little bit you know just to get some ideas about what you want to do for bass tone i'm like all right yeah cool what's his number and she's like oh no no he doesn't have a phone i'm like what you're gonna call this dude who i'm gonna make sure he's in the room the same time that max is there and you call this guy and uh, it was it was just so wild i loved That's it wild <laughs> yeah and i saw igor uh like a week ago we played in london uh, old man gloom played in london with igor's band pet brick and they were he told me. He, amazing he told me he uh he sent me when you when when you were um when i announced you were coming on the show he reached out and he was like he, yeah he, he, igor's he, the uh, best man he's a good dude man he, he, he's, he, he's he, like he like we were saying earlier when you meet somebody that you just know right away like this yeah. is this dude does this because he he fucking loves music and like you know i've met a, a lot of people through this over the years and like a lot of people that really think their shit doesn't stink and you know whatever that's fine but igor is a dude his shit doesn't stink but he does not treat you that way like he yeah just loves music and yeah he's so fucking supportive you know it, it's just he's the best and like yeah the most punk men in thrash you're right i, he's I a, have he's a, a hardcore I have, kid yeah he is i have a very fond memory of when i was tour managing for biohazard we did a biohazard sepultura tour when when right when derek joined the band uh it was their first american tour it was like that record against it was yeah it was sepultura and biohazard and we did a, a long tour in America together, spent a lot of time with those guys. And it really, it was really, really, uh, uh, really uh, cherished. I look back, it, it was, it was great. Uh, GP says Igor's band. Uh, I didn't know of this band. Absent in body. Absent yeah. In body? They, they I, just put familiar. out an album. Yeah. Right. It just came out like a couple of weeks ago or maybe a month ago. It's um, Igor, uh, Scott Kelly, uh, Matt from from Amin Ra and mm. somebody else. I'm brain farting, but okay. um, it's great. Yeah, I mean hey, Igor Magnus, has impeccable taste. Magnus asks, "Who wrote the riff for Doom Riders' The Chase?" Chris Papecki. <laughs> there you go. Not right? me. Sorry, <laughs> I'm not that guy. <laughs> That's great. That's freaking great. Uh, um. Let me see. What else? Uh, yeah, pal. Let's see. Um, speaking of Danzig, that Doom Riders possession cover was dope. Oh, thank you. That yeah. um, 
I believe that is actually how Danzig became aware of us. And, is that right? Uh, yeah, that's how we ended up up going on tour with him. I like literally, from what I understand, he was in a record store. We did that split with uh, with Coliseum with a with a photo of him on it, and he looked. I, I guess he was like, "What the fuck is this?" And then he played it and was like, "This band's awesome!" And asked us to go on tour. Glenn's like, I love that. that. Yeah, Glenn's like it, that. It yeah. was awesome. And then uh, he he gets a bad rap sometimes, man. He, he like, does. He he's does. Been, he's never been anything but fucking cool to me, man. And and like super supportive. Uh, I ran into him on the street in New York, uh, like the day before Misfits played uh, um, MSG. And mm -hmm. me and Steve Brodsky were walking by because Kaven was playing that night. And we were like, holy shit, that's it's uncle Glenn, you know? And, uh, so we just walked up to him and, and we're like, Hey, you know, I'm Nate from doom riders, you know, and Steve mutoid man had toured with Danzig too. And he was like, Holy shit. I love you guys. And he's talking. And then he looks, he looks directly at me and this blew my mind. And he just goes, what the fuck? You guys never tour anymore. And I was like, how do you know that? Like, wow. Holy shit. And he was like, fucking get it together so we can go on tour together and i was like okay yes do right we'll get it together let's go on tour like holy shit that just blew my mind you know when when um when the alago film that i directed uh screened in 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 hollywood we invited him and, and he came down and uh funny story it was like one of those theaters uh where you ent you entrance kind of in front of the screen so like if you walk in, like everybody kind of sees you. We were just about ready to ready to screen the film. It was like two minutes before screening. And he walks in. And, and, and then the, the, it was like like the movie you were talking about, where like all the air gets sucked out of the room. It was like murmur, 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 murmur. And then whoosh, and people were like, <laughs> There he is. Yeah, like it, Satan has I mean, Satan, it's gotta be Satan tough. has arrived. Satan has arrived to screen the Lago <laughs> film with us, you know? It's got it's got to be tough in a way to be that kind of a of a personality, you know, because yeah. like, yeah, the dude can't go buy fucking cat litter without somebody yeah. bagging on it. It's yeah. like fuck off, man. Let the, people live their lives. Let them do it, you know. Yeah. Like yeah, he uh, oh he said oh so when we did those shows with them, um, so, some people might remember he he actually broke his elbow in Baltimore. He actually fell off the stage. Um, and it was a real bummer. And like, we were, he was fucked up, man. And he, he did it during the fucking show, went backstage for a minute and was like, my arms fucked fucking wrapped a t-shirt around it and made a sling and went back out and finished the show and then finished the fucking tour with a broken elbow played every night with his arm in a sling and didn't do anything about it till after the tour was over. I was like, People fucking, people talk shit. And I'm like, man, you wouldn't do that. You would have fucking gone You, you know, you know, it's sort of like what we were talking about before. Like my early memories uh, of, of, you know, we like I said, we played with the Misfits and I saw them many times early on. Um, Glenn was always the most person, interesting back then. Glenn was always the most personable uh, of the bunch back then, you know? I believe it. Uh, and, and it was the brothers, Jerry and Doyle, that were like really standoffish, you know? I I could see that. Um, you know, that makes sense. I, I, I've I've met Doyle and he was very, very nice, but also standoffish, you know, like he has yeah. his own thing going on and it, that's cool, you know? Here, but you're, yeah, you're, like, yeah. Danzig and, has never been anything but cool to me. Yeah. As a, I know you're a big Misfits lover. I just want to, I just want to share a photo, uh, a, a photo from the archive here. This is uh, the Misfits in uh, at the Cambridge Church in uh, in Massachusetts. Oh right? shit! There's Alba Rill. And, and do you see me with my shirt off behind, like to the to the right of Alba Rill with my with my shirt? Oh, off that's you. Shoes. Yeah, that's me, man. Yep. No way! That's awesome. Yep. There it is. We're out there. We're, we're, we're cutting it up. And uh, I got my shirt off and my Dukes up, you know, 18 years old, you know. That is fucking awesome. 
Yeah. I'm jealous. Yeah, that's, that was that was we rented we rented this fucking church in Cambridge for like a, a fucking, you know, DIY, you know, punk rock show and the fucking yes. misfits played and it was just chaos, man. Dude, that is awesome. I am yeah. so jealous. So jealous. Yeah. Good one. You know. Yeah, Larry Kelly knows. Larry Kelly was there. He 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 remembers, man. Um so I'm a so fan. Go. Yeah, man. I'm a I know, fan I know. of Larry I, Kelly. <laughs> yeah, Larry. Yeah, yeah. We love Larry Kelly. He's Larry Kelly's the we call him the Mr. Wolf of the New York hardcore scene. He's like, you know, whenever <laughs> whenever there's like that crisis problem, the first person I call is Larry Kelly and we fucking solve it. That's you awesome. Know? Yeah. So hey. I want to thank you a million for coming on. I really enjoyed the show today. You thank know? you for having me, man. I did as well. It was yeah, a great time. Yeah. Anybody you want to shout out or thank? Any sponsor stuff or anything like that? And any any anybody? I mean, thank you. Uh, thanks, fucking everybody. Come to a cave in show or a converge show. I would love to say hello. Um, <laughs> also, I'm going to shout out another. Uh, Another alumni from your show, Eugene Robinson, who I saw in uh, in the UK last week, and he had very very uh, nice things to say about you. Yeah, he's a good dude, man. Eugene's a, it, it, Eugene, Eugene's another guy, boy. Back in the day, he was feared. He I was a he was he was a he's tough still feared. Kid. He's he's yeah. fucking terrifying. He's yeah. terrifying. <laughs> he was a tough kid back in the day. Man, I do yeah. I do not doubt that. But yeah. like I. You know, I I know we're done here, but I just got to say, like those commercials with the most interesting man in the world, <laughs> that sh that should be Eugene. That dude has stories like no one I've ever met in my life. Fantastic. That yeah, he's 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 great, man. He, he's a yeah. good dude. Um, I wish you all the best out there. You're gonna hear from me. I want to come down. I want to see you play, man. So uh, yeah, I, I, I'll let up. you know. Yeah, I'm, I'll make it happen. I'll try not to suck. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. All the best. Have a good rest of the weekend. I'll talk to you soon, Nate. Take you too, care. man. Take care. Bye bye. Well, there you have it. Great show today. You know what? What a great show it was today. And and thank you all for being a part of it. Um, we do great shows. It's what we it's what we do. And it's 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 just great, great chat room today. It's so great to have you know, uh, all you in there and, 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 uh, just a part of it, paying attention and loving it and, and asking the smart questions, you know, I still, I'm still amazed by what we do here. Sometimes, um, people love being a part of it and, and, and anytime some, some schmuck shows up, they, you guys chase him out of the room. So, so it's great. Yeah. Now go record some vocals. I am actually, Actually, Tristan just texted me. I said, how's it going? He says, we're crushing through it. Crushing through it. Listen, all we're trying to do today is get uh, drums and bass. You know, a little bit, a little bit. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Daisha. I hope you're well, hon. I hope, uh, yep. I hope you're well. And uh, yeah, Nate is great. Great guy. Um, just, just, I had a good feeling about it. And uh, it, it just it just went really well. So have a good rest of the weekend, everybody. Um, we'll see you this Wednesday uh, with uh, with Cat Popper and uh, Women of the Pit Spotlight. We'll be back in a couple of days. So until then, do good things, and good things will come to you. <laughs>